Welcome to our next talk on, um, as you, you've seen previously, we've been talking about societal regeneration. We've talked about social innovation and then also what could be the vehicle for it. And Professor Ronnie is here with me again. Uh, and he, he and his other colleagues have proposed that a university is that institution which can host all these new social innovation as well as um, uh, you know societal they can play a role in societal regeneration so today we're going to talk about um, transformation journey and what we call or uh, professor ronnie has come up with societal phd which we call a big phd in capitals because it's a process of holistic development so welcome, Ronnie. Thank you for being here again with us. But let's start with a transformation journey because we, we use this term a lot. And I actually fell in love with this term and that was the reason I also jumped on your societal PhD. Uh, but when we, uh, what is the distinction? My question is because when we say transformation journey, people just assume automatically it's about self-development, but of course it's not just about self-development. And you very beautifully and eloquently, you bridge the gap between the self and the societal regeneration or being a responsible uh, person and citizen of the society. So over to you, can you please explain what is a transformation journey in your terms? Thank you. Okay, so let's make a link between the transformation journey and the societal PhD, which we have in mind. Uh, if we take a formal step back, bear in mind that in the world at large, there are conventionally two kinds of PhD. There's a conventional academic PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, and there's a professional PhD, which is prolific, particularly in the UK where I live, for professional people to, in a sense, become masters or doctors of their practice. And we're proposing a third kind, which is a societal PhD, which we'll say a little more about and link it with the transformation journey. So if we step aside to the transformation journey, as an as most people assume well, you know, many people go on transformation journeys, whether it's part of a formal degree process or part of their own life journey, many people undergo transformation. But when we talk of transformation journey, it's both individual and collective. So it's both you as an individual and your community and or your organization, if not also your society. And this is, of course, a big leap. And then people will say, well, how on earth does it actually take place? And it takes place through what we call our innovation ecosystem. In fact, there are two entities, and that's linking the societal PhD, as you will see with the transformation journey. The one is we call interpersonal, and the other we call inter-institutional. So the inter-institutional, and some of you have heard of this before, is the community, which brings together the transformation journey, the learning community, the research academy, and the socioeconomic laboratory. So you can already see that through this combination of institutions co-engaged with you in a transformation journey, it's not just an individual process. But that's a rather general and abstract notion to bring all these entities together. And frankly, it's not easy either. So oh. interpersonally, you need a particular cast of characters who engage in a sense together on this transformation journey. The cost of characters are, yes, your conventional educators and researchers, because bear in mind, we are talking about something which is associated with a degree program in and around a university. But we're also talking about stewardship. They need to be senior influential people in the society who become part of your transformation journey explicitly, not just implicitly. We're also talking about facilitators and developers people in organizations and communities who help you operationalize your transformation. And then next comes the most important of all and the most unrecognized, which we call catalyzation. Catalysts are people who both in theory and practice actually connect the different dots, connect the different people, connect the different bodies of theory, connect the different worlds, connect the different institutions. 
that is the most vital function of all if the transformation journey is to be for real. Thank you. Um, but let's break it down in easy terms <laughs> because I, I want this for everyone to understand, not just the academics or people who intend to do a PhD. But uh, going back on transformation journey, I remember when I started my journey with you in Transform, uh, the thing which uh, particularly attracted me was the the transcultural aspect that you know I'm I'm part of I'm a Muslim I'm a Pakistani woman but also I'm I am part of a greater um, you know the whole tapestry of different cultures then I'm living in an, another culture so particularly when we start you have to ground yourself in your particular culture and your values. And that is what really attracts me because that then doesn't separate me from what I'm going to learn as, you know, or investigate or research as an academic or researcher, but I'm kind of forwarding that cause. So can you please shed some light on that? Why is this important firstly for your own transformation? Okay, so I, there's a simple answer and a more complex one. The simple answer is, particularly if you study the arts, if not the sciences, that most creativity arises at the edge of one culture feeding into another. It's always this crossing between different worlds. Very often the most creative people are the people who have lived in different worlds in a conscious kind of way and brought different worlds together. So that's at a kind of simple level that this transcultural element is, is a keynote of creativ creativity, if not transformation. The second thing is through our long observations and participation over decades, we have found that particular cultures have particular strengths, particular gifts to bring to the world. And that if you want to transform in a fundamental thoroughgoing way, you need to tap into the gifts of different worlds and different cultures. For example, amongst my fellow Africans being born and bred in Africa, identifying with your ground, with nature, is predominant amongst people in my particular culture in that way, which doesn't mean that other cultures don't do that, but it's oh. dominating tendency in that part of the world. I mean... Needless to say, if you go to America, this is the, the home ground of entrepreneurship, which doesn't mean there isn't entrepreneurship in other parts of the world, but it comes naturally to those Westerners in America. So each has the, the, the spirituality, the world religions that you are part of, Anika, is very much an Eastern phenomenon that we actually see, and the whole capacity to systematize the negative side of it being colonized, of course, coming from the European North. So each culture has particular attributes to bring to bear. That's, if you like, the one side of the transformation story, why we need to rub shoulders with different cultures. The other side is that what we call our gene, that each of these cultures, in a sense, has a particular keynote so that the South, we connect with grounding, right? Particularly grounded, very strong sense of identity right the east is very associated with harmonizing different elements the holistic impulse so that's what we call e the emergence where you emerge by harmonizing the local and the global and one culture and another the north which is the more systematic which we call navigation steering is more to do with consolidating, institutionalizing this kind of thing. And the West, as we already said, associated with enterprise and actualization. So that G-E-N-E, -E, in a sense, needs to become part of your transformation journey. And to heighten that, this is our keynote, which you've highlighted, Anika, we need to rub close shoulders with different cultures individually and institutionally it's not enough for me to rub shoulders with you as an individual coming from the east i need to rub shoulders with your sufism for example which is an institutionalizing of your individuality mm. so that is mainly the difference between um, societal phd or mm -hmm. your phd to transform phd compared to other phds which but basically are for your personal gain because you achieve a doctorate you get a degree you are acknowledged as a researcher as an academic but then your 
your job is just to keep on producing papers or books or whatever. But compared to the societal PhD that we are proposing, you are actively and engaged in bringing about that transformation for not just for yourself, but your community and your society. Um, yes. I, yes. So, and what is absolutely key is that your society is engaged with you on that journey. Yes. And to make that abstraction concrete that a particular community or communities, a particular laboratory or laboratories and a, a research academy, an intellectual base is working with you on that transformation journey and needs to be, in a sense, visible from an early stage explicitly. So it's not just your PhD, it's our PhD, their PhD together. Yes, but isn't it a daunting task? Because, you know, in my experience, I think most people just see, we see ourselves like, who am I? I mean, how can I transform or bring about regeneration on a societal level? Unless, and of course, as you suggested, I'm part of those, those organizations or, you know, the institutions also support uh, my journey, my transformation journey, then that's a very far reaching kind of end goal. Yeah. But do you think and people succeed in that? The question you raise is a very important one, because it is a very difficult task to take on. And frankly, not a task that we see other people and organizations engaged in. And if you're being a pioneer in that respect, it's always a difficult journey. For that very reason, in the same way as your conventional PhD, both kinds, the academic one and the professional one, have huge institutional bodies to oh. accredit them. We in time need to build up a, such an institutional body which accredits a societal PhD for the very reason you raise. Otherwise, it's very fragile. You're at the mercy of whether one particular organization continues to support the process or not. Yes. Okay, final words. What is this going to, uh, what purpose this transformation journey would serve um, in a, on a societal, not just on a societal, but on a self or personal level, in your view? What purpose would it serve? So, sorry. Okay, well, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of say both then, Anika, on a personal and societal level, because as we see around us, tragically, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, or Israel, Palestine, that we have all of these malfunctions in the world, and the only way seemingly to resolve them is geopolitically, you know, whether it involves the military or the political, somehow these geopolitical forces need to realign, and we feel in that sense we're on a hiding to nothing. It'll be a continuous vicious circle because the geopolitical leaves out nature and culture it doesn't start from inner and outer nature and from our particular cultures the unique gifts we bring to the world so to the extent that the societal phd becomes writ large in the world so we can engage in one of our favorite words regeneration rather than rely on these geopolitical geopolitical forces to sort things out which fundamentally they don't Yes, true. I agree with you. Thank you. I think this is short and sweet. <laughs> I hope this message reaches far and wide and people Thank can you. connect with it. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks.